Not all men are born brave, and not many men live to be heroes. This is the story of brave and heroic men who leave the safety of their homes and families to rescue those in peril on the sea. When the Royal National Lifeboat Institution was founded, it was dedicated to the preservation of life from shipwreck. That aim has never changed. If the call comes, the lifeboat puts to sea, no questions asked in even the foulest of foul weather. The RNLI is arguably the finest rescue service in the world, manned by an elite, honed to perfection. The crews themselves deny they're either brave or heroes, but make up your own mind as you listen to their story, Heroes of the Sea. It was at Bamba Castle on the Northumberland coast that the first organized attempts were made to save ships and lives from the sea. In 1771, the crew trust ordered that in stormy weather, two men from the castle should regularly patrol the coast from sunset to sunrise. If they saw a ship in distress, one man was to return immediately and warn the castle. A cannon would be fired to summon the villagers. In the shadow of these massive chains, used to secure ships in difficulties, those rescued were given food and warmth. It was a modest beginning that would lead to greater things. At the mouth of the River Tyne in 1789, there occurred a disaster so shocking that the conscience of the whole country was aroused. The ship Adventure went down in full sight of the shore. Crowds stood watching helplessly as one by one the crew dropped exhausted from the rigging and drowned. Not a boat in Tynemouth could reach them in the storm. Those watching on shore felt a dreadful impotence. So without delay, a competition was organized to design a lifeboat. It was won by William Woodhave, the parish clerk of South Shields. His design was modified by the judges and given to Henry Greathead to build. And Greathead produced the original, the first in the world to be designed and built purely as a lifeboat. She was 30 feet long, had six pairs of oars and rose sharply at bow and stern where there were cases filled with cork. These cases, a cork-lined hull and a casing along her gunwale, all served to give her extra buoyancy. She was a great success. But one lifeboat could serve only a small area of the coast, so other areas tried their own solutions. A Douglas Isle of Man, a tower of refuge was built in the bay, where shipwrecked sailors could shelter. It was Sir William Hillary who put up much of the money to build the tower. Hillary was a man of ideals and energy, who had the determination to see his vision transformed into reality. He'd come to live in this house overlooking Douglas Bay after a life of travel and adventure, and his questing spirit led him to become an active member of the local lifeboat crew. His record of three gold medals has only once been equaled. But he did even more. Sir William's pamphlets and projects were legion. Not all of them bore fruit, but this one certainly did. There was an outburst of enthusiasm at the birth of what became the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, and a number of new lifeboat designs were promptly suggested. The Bedford succeeded the original, similar in proportion, but much improved. In East Anglia, they preferred a lifeboat developed from the local beach boats. They utilized water ballast, so making it easier to launch from the long, flat beaches. Pellu Plenty designed early sailing lifeboats, but George Palmer's design was accepted as the first RNLI lifeboat. It took another newsworthy rescue to keep public interest alive. Dear sirs, in answer to your request, I have to state that on the morning of the 7th of September, it was blowing a gale with wind from the north. One quarter before five, my daughter observed a vessel on the Arcus Rock. 
but owing to the darkness and the spray going over her, could not observe any person, though the glass was incessantly applied. Until near seven o'clock, when the tide being fallen, we observed three or four men upon the rock. We immediately launched our boat and was enabled to gain the rock where we found eight men and a woman, which I judged rather too many to take at once in the state of the weather, and therefore took the woman and four men to the Longstone. Two of them returned with me and succeeded in bringing the remainder in all nine persons safely to the Longstone about nine o'clock. Your most obedient servant, William Darling. But that was not the end of the story. Grace Darling soon captured the public's imagination. She became a national heroine. Songs were written about her. Offers to appear in public were made. All this led to renewed enthusiasm for anything to do with saving lives at sea. There was a gratifying response when the Duke of Northumberland organized a competition for a new lifeboat design. There were 280 entries. All kinds of materials were suggested and the designs put forward were every bit as curious as the materials. But the winners of the competition were very carefully selected on a practical point system. The winning design by James Beeching scored an impressive 84 points an ingeniously designed boat capable of pulling and sailing in all weathers, a stable self-writer, buoyant and fast-draining. It seemed impossible to achieve a design that would satisfy all the demands made on a lifeboat. And of course, as much as the designers and judges tried, the sea continued to take its toll. There were 29 souls on board. We were four days out of Middlesbrough, and it had been thick weather ever since the afternoon of the Sunday on which we sailed. You must know, sir, that hereabouts, the good winds, the water's just a network of shoals. For to the southward lies the knock, and close over against it stretches the long sand, and beyond, down to the westward, is the sunk sand. Scarcely was the ship on the starboard tack when she struck the ground broadside on. Sheets and halyards were let go, but no man durst venture aloft. Every moment threatened to bring her spars crashing about us, and the thundering and beating of the canvas made the mast buckle and jump like fishing rods. As coxswain of the Ramsgate lifeboat, I soon heard that a large ship was ashore on the long sand, and immediately we were ordered to proceed to her assistance. It was blowing a heavy gale of wind, and the moment we were clear of the piers, we felt the strength of it. The men hung in the topmost rigging like corpses. The wind cut through our skins like showers of arrows. I gave up hope when the mizzenmast fell, and I saw my shipmates drowning upon it. We couldn't guess what a fearful sight was there until we had hauled our lifeboat close under her quarter. There looked to be a whole score of dead bodies washing about among the spars. The lifeboat and a steam tug had searched all night before finding her and rescuing the 11 survivors. Yes, steam had made its appearance. And in 1889, the first steam lifeboat went on station at Harwich. She was an interesting design. A powerful pump drew water through an inlet under the boat and discharged it through these horizontal outlet pipes. So, pushing her through the water, she was in fact jet propelled. Six further steam lifeboats were built, but steam had serious drawbacks in bad weather. For water, put out the fires that raised the steam, and that was a major limitation. There's the shipping port on us, issued by the Met Office, at 1710 BST. First, there are warnings of gales in Cromarty, Port, Tyne, Thames, Dover, White, Portland, Plymouth, Lundy, Parsnet, Irish Sea, Manor. The general synopsis at 1300, high 1036 the moving slowly northeast. In the old days in England, they used to launch lifeboats like this. Today, here in Holland, they still do.
internal combustion engines were the next development, and in 1909, the first petrol engine lifeboats arrived at their distant stations in Stronsay and Stromness. Then came the outbreak of the 1914-18 war, with fewer men for the lifeboat crews, and a complete halt to the building of new lifeboats. War rescues, though, gave the motor-powered lifeboats a thorough testing, and the 20s saw them accepted for their increased range and efficiency. Between the wars, wood for lifeboats came from the tropics. This story begins in the Burmese forests, where teak, one of the most durable hardwoods, is felled. It begins also in the dark forests of British Honduras. Mahogany giants crash to the ground. And in our own countryside, tough English oak is used for the stem and stern posts of lifeboats. The institution's timber converter tests one of the crooks with a wooden pattern to see if it is the right shape. The timber converter selects the best crooks, and when possible, these are left out of doors for three years to season. When the crooks are thoroughly seasoned, they are taken to the saw pits, where they are sawn by hand to the correct shape and thickness. Mahogany arrives in this country from abroad in logs, which must be sawn into planks. These go to the institution's timber store, entering at one end of the shed. After a lapse of time, they are removed at the other end, when required for the building of new boats. Thus, woods from many countries of the empire play their part in the construction of a lifeboat. Planks of mahogany are steamed to make them supple, so that they can be bent round the frame and nailed into place, thus forming the first skin over the framework of Canadian rock elm. Over the skin, unbleached calico is stretched. Then a second skin of mahogany is placed over this, which ensures the weather-resisting powers of the boat. Another vital part of the lifeboat are the air cases, which give her buoyancy if she's damaged. They're made of soft wood, strips of calico being glued over the joints. They're painted and tested in a special tank. Then again repainted and marked with the position in which they'll be fitted into the boat. These air cases make it possible to flood all the watertight compartments of a lifeboat and still leave her able to go on with her work. A big lifeboat may have as many as 165 of these air cases, and so the boat is launched in preparation for her trials. Not until she has undergone the severest tests is she handed over to the crew that awaits her. The automatic scuppers are yet another vital feature. They empty out the water as fast as the seas fill the boat. After the trial, she comes back to the builders for a final painting and overhaul. The last coat gives a finish which this perfect example of craftsmanship deserves, a smooth, velvety surface which for all its gloss will soon have to meet the battle with storm and sea. So motor-powered lifeboats quickly became standard, and in 1932 the first diesel engine was installed. Thus range was even further increased. Motor-powered lifeboats were made safer and more reliable in difficult conditions. Nineteen thirty nine and another war. This time there were Air Force survivors to rescue, as well as sailors. And again, the war was to prove a tough testing ground for new lifeboat development. The superiority of diesel power for lifeboat work became so abundantly clear, it was decided to fit Perkins and other makes of diesel engines to all new boats. Every new lifeboat, alteration or innovation is of course thoroughly tested before the lifeboat sees active service. Tests like these have been developed and refined over the years, and today, with the help of elaborate equipment, 
we can simulate a good many of the conditions a lifeboat is likely to meet. Lifeboats designed today, and increasingly so in the future, will be a matter for international cooperation. This American 44-foot steel lifeboat was subjected to extensive trials, and as a result, lifeboats of a similar design came to be built here for use in Great Britain and Ireland. Some British-built boats were larger. The Clyde class, built between 1965 and 1974, were 70 feet long. They were the largest lifeboats ever built, intended to travel greater distances and so serve larger areas. They were made of steel, light, strong and quick to build. But they had their limitations, just as James Beeching's design had in 1851. Much progress had been made since that time. Over 86,000 lives had then been saved. 147 lifeboats were in commission, and Britain's coastline was fully covered by the RNLI service. We still strive to overcome the perils of the sea. We shall go on trying. But no matter how well designed and made a lifeboat may be, or how good its engines, you still have to man it with a courageous crew before it can do the job. And the job they do is one of the most hazardous in the world. Lifeboatmen venture out in weather that most of us are only too glad to close our front doors on. But will they talk about it? Not often. And when they do, it's in a very self-effacing manner. So it's difficult to find out why they do the job, a job that's voluntary in every way. Why we do it is because that it's, uh, it's satisfaction um, and what the lifeboat's there for. It's a complete satisfaction of knowing that we've got a super boat and a fully trained, a trained crew to carry out any, any sort of rescue. And um, I, I think that's the main thing, is to know that we're equipped adequately enough and, and uh, that we can go and do a, any sort of job in any, we in other, any uh, weather conditions. I sometimes wonder on a stormy night in the winter, but I think if I was out there, I'd like to feel that somebody would come and get me. Uh, I get great satisfaction of this kind of life. Uh, many persons like different types of challenge, but this has been my challenge. I lost a brother in the water just up the river. I know it doesn't matter if there had been a hundred boats in the area, he would never have been saved. But I've often felt that if uh, anything like of that nature happens again, perhaps it could be prevented. You get a bond of friendship between... How many of there is? Twelve? I don't really think that when people turn up to a lifeboat station, they're not what you would call do-gooders. They're not going there because they say, I want to help the community, I want to go out and help save people's lives. They like boats. They like the team spirit that's in the lifeboat service. And the, the end product comes to saving the people's lives. You get those, they turn up, you see, and they think they're Britain's answer to action, man. But as I say, they don't last long. They don't last long. Now the story of a lifeboat legend. His name is Henry Blogg. Blogg was coxswain of the Cromer lifeboat for 38 years. Cromer, on the Norfolk coast, faces one of the most dangerous areas of the North Sea, the Haysborough Sands, one of the more notorious hazards around our coasts. A lifeboatman's maxim, one of them anyway, is we have to go out, we don't have to come back. Strong northeasterly winds sweep the North Sea at Cromer and can make it especially perilous for shipping. 
The lifeboat launches down a slipway from the end of Cromer Pier, while along the beach to the south lies the museum, where one would swear the spirit of Henry Blogg survives. there was nothing he wanted more than to become a fisherman like his father, John James Davis. Many were the tales that Henry had heard of wrecked schooners and hobblers held fast by the treacherous Haysborough Sands some 13 miles out, or even further away on Hammond Knoll, held fast till their backs were broken by the conflicting currents. This was the boat in which Henry first saw service under his stepfather, John James Davis. In a manner similar to this, the Louisa Hartwell was launched one day in 1917 to go to the aid of a small Greek steamer that had begun to drift during the night. It was slow work pulling the boat over the sand and down to the water's edge, and even harder to get her away in the tremendous sea. Soldiers stationed in the town plunged waist deep into the water to hold the boat on an even keel, for she was threatening to capsize in the surf. Eventually, the crew pressed by a grim Henry, pulled her away, but so strong was the tide that she drifted a full mile westward, narrowly missing the pier before she could make sufficient offing to set sail. The steamer was not more than two miles away, but it took the lifeboat four hours hard sailing to reach her and take off her exhausted crew of 16, and yet longer before the boat safely beached again. Meanwhile, another urgent call found Henry and his weary men launching again. An explosion had ripped the Swedish ship Furnabo in two. Twice the lifeboat was launched, only to be driven back with many oars smashed. But Henry would not admit defeat and launched a third time, to the amazement of the crowds on shore who watched, taut with fear, as the lifeboat fought her way from the surf towards the two halves of the Furnabo. Laden with wood, they were drifting landward. Eight hours after the explosion, 11 terrified men were still clinging to the stern half of the furniture. Henry knew he had to win this time and urged his tired crew forward. They would succeed, and they did, bringing the 11 men ashore after two grueling hours. It had been a tough day. The crew had carried out a magnificent rescue under Henry's inspired leadership. They were the first lifeboatmen to be awarded the bronze medal while their cocks received the gold medal, the lifeboatmen's BC. 1927 was drawing to its unusually stormy close when the call he'd foreseen came through. Within minutes, the motor lifeboat was on her way to the oil tanker SS Georgia. Her back was broken. Her forepart was held in the irresistible grip of the Haysboroughs with 15 men aboard. Her stern half was drifting. Only when thousands of gallons of oil had burst from her tanks could the HF Bailey approach. After 40 nerve-wracking hours, the men knew they would live. From the Prince of Wales, Henry received his second gold medal, the Seafoy Founder. Henry had been called out to another vessel, so the reserve rowing boat was pulled hurriedly to the beach. The two seamen in the rigging could be heard above the roar of the waves as the Alexandra was launched. Their position was serious indeed, as huge seas came crashing over the body of the barge, threatening to dislodge the mast and tear them from their precarious hold. Only 50 yards of murderous surf separated them from safety. Neither rocket line nor lifeboat could reach them. Helplessly, hopelessly, they watched the lifeboat struggling a third time to get clear of the broken water and contemptuously tossed back. Then, just as it seemed the incoming tide would swamp the barge, the number one boat came into view. With time running out, Blog had to act fast. He rammed the barge and one man was snatched clear. Those on shore watched in silent admiration as Blog repeated his brilliant maneuver. 
as the damaged lifeboat pulled away, a hoarse cheer rose for the two men saved through Blogg's faultless seamanship. Once again, Henry Blogg's name was in the headlines. He had shown both the skill and imagination that made him outstanding among men. With peace, the nations turned to count their losses and their dead. But Cromer counted 150 launches with 448 lives saved. Her lifeboat had the finest war record in the country. The Duchess of Kent came to Cromer in 1945, meeting for the first time the proud holder of the George Cross. His name was to be given to the new lifeboat, for the H.F. Bailey's work was almost done. Henry Blogg sadly gave up the coxswainship of the number one lifeboat in 1947. But none could forget him. He was so well respected that thousands came a year later to the presentation ceremony that marked his 53 years of service. He said, I'm very pleased to accept this boat for the station because I know it's the best boat that's ever been on it. Blog had just given his first and last public speech. Sir John Cunningham then officially launched the Henry Blog three years after she'd come to the station. As the beflagged boat went down the slipway, many of those watching must have prayed that she would rise to the occasion as gallantly as her namesake had always done. Even fearless men need backup, support from boat builders and chandlers. Nowadays, from the headquarters at Poole, they can provide anything the lifeboat needs, and fast. Previously, this depot was at Boreham Wood. Replacements for sure. In this office, we receive the replacement reports from all the lifeboat stations on the coast. We pride ourselves that whatever they require will be on the road to them within an hour. I'd like to show you how we do it. In these rows of shelves are kept all the smaller items, each with its own card with name and pattern number indexed. 45,000 different things that a lifeboat and its crew could need, from a riding light to a diving suit, axes and anchors, paint and propellers, lighting cable, shackles, binoculars, beeswax, thimbles. Whether it's a compass or a needle, it's here. And so is the rum. The varied coastline of our island calls for many types of lifeboat, and replacements for all of them have to be kept in stock. A rudder to fit the Shoreham boat is found, and one by one, the list is made up. Along in the next door are kept the chains. There are 50 different sizes. No matter what kind of chain is needed, we can supply it, and have it cut to the required length before it leaves the store. Here in our machine shops, we not only carry out repairs, but make all sorts of fittings for the engines. No boat store would be complete without its rope loft, and its sights and smells are like the breath of the sea to every sailor. To anyone with any feeling for ships and the sea, this modern stores and equipment block at Poole is like an Aladdin's cave. It even smells right. But more than that, it illustrates the director's comments about the pursuit of excellence. No matter where you find her, you'll never see an RNLI lifeboat looking down at heel. There are two reasons for that. The care and pride lavished upon her by her own people, and also the backup provided by this superb chandlery and workshops which can provide her every need and if necessary in very short order. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Yar and Eli is a charity supported totally by donations and volunteer fundraising. Flag days, fates, everything from museums to coffee mornings help the nationwide effort. The bounding energies of RNLI supporters are as strong inland as by the coast. Wherever people gather together in large numbers, branches and guilds set up stalls which offer a range of RNLI merchandise. A marked up memento of the institution's achievements make an ideal gift or souvenir of a day out. That one is three pounds, my love. Go and have a look at it. It's our latest lifeboat. The latest addition to the fleet, the Lady Elizabeth Brownlee. All the proceeds for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Commercial interests sometimes join forces with the RNLI to help raise funds and provide an altruistic interest for the employees and customers. The Together We Care campaign of Volvo concessionaires provided several motor cars as the top prizes in a countrywide raffle. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution. And if you don't win, consider your support in the lifeboat service. Those pennies and pounds have added up to buy this, a new Mersey-class lifeboat capable of reaching a casualty at over 20 miles per hour. The Coast Guards watch and listen from their lookout high above the needles. Inevitably, a Mayday message is picked up and the Lifeboat Honorary Secretary gives the go-ahead to launch. Two boats are in trouble some 20 miles out in the channel. One is a small cruising yacht with no steering. The second is a motor sailor which tried to tow the first stricken yacht. The sea at times reaches the top deck of the lifeboat nearly 20 feet above the waterline. On board are a husband and wife with two young children. The sea anchor goes aboard before the difficult task of transferring the crew to the light. The coxswain manoeuvres 30 tonnes of boat in the steep channel swell within feet of the stricken sloop. Two volunteers man a 10-foot inflatable and pick up the children. The boat was built at home by a naval officer. Having to abandon the vessel is a sad moment for the family. Back at the Needles, Coast Guards warn passing shipping to keep clear of the abandoned hull. Other vessels will stand by to offer help. Yarmouth lifeboat turns to help the second stricken yacht. A tired 65-year-old Leslie Hurst takes the tow line. He's been at sea with his wife all day. Between them, they had tried to tow the other boat. When a rope disabled their own engine, they hoisted the sails, but these soon blew out under the extra strain. It was only then that help was asked for. Mr. Hurst later described these conditions in a press interview as the worst weather he'd seen in 25 years of sailing.
Calls on the lifeboat service can mean amateur sailors in trouble, fishing boats sinking, ferries on fire, ships in distress, or missing aircraft. Lifeboat crews, almost to a man, are modest, enthusiastic volunteers. They receive very little financial reward. The survival of others at sea is what matters. And it is the very rare exception, rather than the rule, that RNLI crews claim salvage. It doesn't look very likely in this case anyway. This was the Weymouth lifeboat, the 54-foot Aran-class Tony Vanderbilt, aiding a fishing boat sinking off Portland Bill in November 1982. The sea was relatively calm that day, but over half the calls on the Weymouth lifeboat are to help vessels in trouble in the notorious Portland race. From the start, suspense. In the dark, it was difficult to assess the situation. When the ship grounded just after four o'clock, those on board did not know where they were or that there was help at hand. The rescuers on the shore could not contact them and the first rocket line was not properly secured on the ship and had to be cast off. Frustration for the men who labored so hard in a gale that made it difficult to stand and lashed their faces with stinging sand. When dawn broke, the plight of the ship was plain to see. Hard fast between the groin and the pier at South Shields, Adel Fotis II was rocking on her keel as the waves swept over her. The Greek crew on the Lebanese steamer could now see the shore and safety only 200 yards away. But between them lay a stretch of sea that boiled with the fury of the wind. Then another rocket line was fired. The line secured, the big haul now started. It was the first time either life-saving brigade had taken part in a rescue since the end of the war but their efforts didn't flag for one moment, and soon the first man was making the hazardous trip to land in a breacher's ball. Helping hands were waiting. Even so, every step was an effort. Policemen ran the rescued up the beach to keep their circulation going. Some of the lifesavers had the special job of grabbing the seamen in the freezing water, and the same rescuers went in time and again. One of them had to be taken to hospital after his long ordeal in the waves. One of the Greek seamen collapsed unconscious in the water and had to be dragged up onto the beach. quick first aid treatment. After a few minutes, the seamen recovered. The wind was so strong that the life-saving men had to act as human anglers to hold down their breaches for rigging. The rescue of the 22 seamen, including their skipper, took two hours. The constant falling on the heavy ropes began to wear down the determined life-saving countrymen and spectators were called upon to help. Some of them were women. The minutes seemed like hours, but the operation went on. The eager handshake of one of the rescued seamen shows only too well their thankfulness to be saved after seven hours of peril. The story starts here with a Mayday SOS call and the news that an oil rig with 33 aboard has broken its toe in the English Channel and in hurricane conditions is being washed helplessly ashore onto the coast of Guernsey. Even before it strikes, a rescue is underway. Out there in the blackness is the Guernsey lifeboat. On its way across the Channel is a Royal Navy helicopter. On shore, the land rescue services are alerted and already on the scene. The rigs are ground. At sea, there's a rescue in progress. The lifeboat's alongside and the helicopter's overhead. On land, the search continues. A life raft is washed up, and a check reveals that perhaps fortunately no one's tried to use it. From bitter experience, Guernsey has learned to be prepared. Powerful searchlights have been brought to the headland, and further down the coast, the St. John Ambulance mobile radar unit has been plotting the rig's course since the first Mayday call. The first survivors are landed by helicopter at the airport five miles away. 
The men owe their safety to the skill of the Royal Navy pilots from Cornwall, men who flew across the channel over mountainous seas at a moment's notice, not knowing what they'd find, men who've manoeuvred their aircraft in 80 mile an hour winds to within inches of the oil rig's legs, and all of it in darkness. A growing pile of sea-soaked life jackets reflects the mounting number of men who are safe. They've exchanged wet clothes for dry blankets, and faces that showed fear and shock from a terrifying ordeal are now almost ready to smile again. But while the rescued smile, the rescuers know there are still men on board the rig. At this moment, two of the lucky ones are aboard the lifeboat. During the night, six salvage men have gone aboard Orion to prepare for the pull-off set for this morning. They've been running the compressors and preparing cables in readiness, but with such a sea running, it doesn't look hopeful. More important, they've severed the links joining Orion to its barge. As high tide approaches, the rig is rocking in the swell. Once again, men are at risk in appalling conditions. The coxswain of the lifeboat is John Petty. It would be an understatement to say that a lot depends on him and his crew. Navigating here within inches of these needle-sharp rocks and 14,000 tons of cold steel. It's the first time in the Western world that an oil rig's been pounded ashore. But it's not the first time this lifeboat's been out to Orion. That was the night it came aground when two men were saved. In that rescue, the lifeboat was damaged, with broken radar, radio aerials, and a hole in the cabin roof. The boat Cox and Petty's handling with such skill isn't his normal lifeboat. That's away temporarily, being surveyed and overhauled. This is an older vessel of the relief fleet, here to maintain the RNLI's 24-hour, year-round, nationwide coverage, for which scores of thousands of seafarers owe their lives. This is where seamanship counts from coxswain and crew alike. Judging the moment with superb handling, John Petty runs alongside for a line to be thrown aboard. He knows that under his lifeboat in the heavy swell lies a row of jagged rock pinnacles which could tear all too easily through the hull. A line's attached, and with it rise the spirits of the six salvage men. They're ready for this moment, and with life jackets on, they've been watching for the line that'll link them to the lifeboat in safety. The swell's so heavy that it's taken several attempts for the lifeboat to come alongside. The coxswain decides to move round right into the lee side of the barge. It's closer to the rocks, but sheltered from the very worst of the storm for taking the men off. And within seconds, all the men are aboard, helped by the strong hands of the crew. This isn't a sea to hang about in. The 40-foot rise and fall of the tide here is among the greatest in Europe. And as the water goes down, every second brings the lifeboat closer to the rocks beneath. Last man aboard, it's time to move the fenders and go. Under the waterline of Federal 402 are 20-foot gashes, and no master of any ship will treat such rocks lightly, least of all a lifeboat coxswain. The coxswain heads his lifeboat back into the open sea, if such a sea can be called open. Driving right into the teeth of the gale, it starts the 12-mile journey back towards St. Peterport, the harbour and dry land for those on board. If no man is an island, the same goes for lifeboats. And what more obvious place for lifeboats to look for support than to the air? The helicopter has been the most dramatic single advance in saving life at sea since the RNLI itself was formed 150 years ago. Today, in 1974, the RNLI is only one part of a vast and sophisticated search and rescue operation. Certainly. You can get very, very many more in, but at a short range, if it's something in Solent, you can yeah. get half a dozen or more in. Nice. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can be scrambled off the outstanding and in the air in well under two minutes. Yeah. Uh, nav tower, it would take us about five minutes, five or six minutes. Oh. The British Airways helicopter at Dice near Aberdeen can be converted from cargo and passenger carrying to life-saving in minutes. In the North Sea, around the Shetlands and in the Celtic Sea, the use of helicopters for search and rescue work will increase because of oil.
Helicopters don't compete with lifeboats, they're complementary. Each has its own advantages and drawbacks of speed, range and capacity. Oil rings also serve as fuel dumps, so vastly increasing helicopters' range. They also employ highly paid men who more and more are taking to boats to relax at weekends, so increasing the need for life-saving services. Today, thanks to oil rigs and their helicopter tenders, the North Sea is better patrolled and therefore safer for seamen than it has ever been. OK, fair enough, then. Uh, we'll get airborne. An SO tank. OK, we'll get airborne. Um, he doesn't require a doctor to go with him, do you? OK, then, fair enough. We'll get airborne and go on down. Cheers. Five miles southwest of Dungeness, course east. The name of the tanker, I spell Hotel Alpha Uniform Tango, Echo Lima Lima Uniform Mike. A routine but typical call to ferry an injured man ashore from a ship in the channel, a medivac. It would take a lifeboat half a day, a helicopter less than an hour. Uh, we've been scrambled for a medivac uh, from a tanker about 25 miles southwest of Dungeness. Um, we would like to bring him into you. Apparently, he has suffered from um, unconsciousness. Thirty-two minutes after takeoff, the tanker was sighted in mid-channel. Lifeboats will work with helicopter crews from time to time. The speed with which a helicopter can airlift an injured or sick man to shore can save valuable time and possibly life. Alternatively, medical help can be winched from the helicopter to the deck of a ship if need be. Helicopter support has been the most significant single advance in saving life at sea since the founding of the RNLI. Now, on the sea and in the air, we have a vast and sophisticated search and rescue operation. Far from being competitive, the services complement each other. Both have advantages and drawbacks when it comes to speed, range and capacity. With the increase in leisure activities at sea, the advent of air-sea rescues has meant that the waters around our coasts are now better patrolled and therefore safer than ever before. In 1960, trials began with fast inflatable boats called Zodiacs. These little craft showed remarkable stability and resistance to capsize in heavy swell and surf, rather like a raft. Capable of over 20 knots, compared with the 8 or 9 knots of the larger lifeboats, they can operate close to rocks or alongside small capsized or damaged boats and search among wreckage. And being low in the water, they can pick up survivors relatively easily.
And so from the pioneer Zodiacs, the present inflatable, the D-class boat was born. It went into service in 1963, operating from Sandy Beach, Shingle Shore or Harbour Slipway these nimble craft were called inshore rescue boats, then inshore lifeboats. Inflatables or rigid inflatables like the Atlantic 21 have another great advantage. They can be patched up as easily as a bicycle tire. Although unlike a bicycle tire, if they're punctured, they don't collapse completely. Because like all lifeboats, they're made up of different compartments. Twin engines are fitted. These are outboard engines, and like everything else, must undergo thorough testing to ensure they're able to withstand the wear and tear they're bound to encounter. certain that every component part is up to scratch, the whole thing has to be tested for self-writing. That's still the biggest danger involved in sea rescues, the force of the waves managing to capsize the lifeboats. Now at last, the boat is ready for action. The Atlantic, also fitted with VHF radio, is the fastest of the ILBs. Her twin 50 horsepower outboards giving a speed of 29 knots over 33 miles an hour and a radius of action of 50 miles. Tides rise swiftly and the speed of the boat is essential when people find themselves cut off. It may be great fun for the spectators, but they're not much help in a tricky situation. A wet, cold day like this increases the risk of severe chilling from exposure. So it's essential to get the girls aboard as quickly as possible and back to base. Once aboard, life jackets are put on, not only for the safety of anyone falling overboard, but as protection from the cold wind created by the speed of the boat. Each year now, a large proportion of total lifeboat services is made up of small ILB rescues of this type. In the coves and inlets of the West Country, holidaymakers are often cut off by the tide or injured falling on rocks. This is where the lifeboat joins forces with the Coast Guards and cliff rescue teams and where the Atlantic 21 comes into its own if the fastest route to medical care is the sea. This is Cliff Man. The casualty is too badly injured to take up the cliff face. We have her in a stretcher. Alert into a rescue. Over. The Atlantic 21 has a fiberglass hull, so it's faster than an ordinary inflatable. Its two 50 horsepower outboard engines take it up to 30 knots in anything but the very worst weather. It does have inflatable tubes or sponsons to provide more buoyancy and stability. And even if all the electrics are submerged and the Atlantic capsizes, the engines will start again at the touch of a button. And in emergencies, the Atlantic can drive straight up onto the beach.
the Atlantic 21 often can reach a casualty in the time it takes to launch one of the larger conventional lifeboats. It's the answer to the problem of rescue in shallow, choppy seas, in surf and among rocks. But the Atlantics can give their three-man crew a severe shaking. They call for a high level of skill and stamina to handle them well. And there's an age limit of 45 for the tough volunteers who man them. So there's an age limit, hardly surprising. We've heard a little of why they do it, but what makes a crew? I joined the lifeboat crew shortly after the station was established at Sheerness. There were a substantial number of people who volunteered for the crew at that time, and most of us were raw landsmen. I had a, a very small boat, of which I was a part owner, and when I go back and think of the things which I did in that little boat now, with the knowledge which I've gleaned of, you know, ten years of tuition by the lifeboat coxswain, I shudder. I took risks which I now see other people taking and which I could disapprove of. If you sat down and thought about it, you wouldn't do it at all, but it's just one of those kind of things. You do it and then you stick to it. There's a lot of discipline on the boat, but after you come off on a service or the training's finished, uh, it's totally relaxed and you, you pile off down to the pub and it's a totally different atmosphere but once you're on the boat then that's where the discipline's got to be and, and you sort of realise that. You know what you've got to do, man overboard, life belt, bow hook, man up forward to point and it's usually the man that seen the man go overboard that goes straight up forward and points at him. We'll try it again. Man up on starboard water! We've got one chief, and everybody else is Indians. The way he runs the boat, uh, perhaps, perhaps not as all lifeboat stations are run, but this one, being a young station, started out with a young crew, inexperienced crew, and he is moulded us to his way of seamanship. He doesn't like anybody messing about. There's time for messing about, and there's time for serious work. If we're out on a service, it is all serious stuff and things don't go properly, he will give you one hell of a rucking. Yes, all right, Chaz. Now, what I want to know is where it's leading. I want to see your arm all the time. It's no good you nodding your head at me, cock. Point where the thing's leading. Sometimes the tone of his voice becomes a little sharp. I've gone up the road, I've come home cursing his name. But uh, if the phone had rung ten minutes after I got home, I'd been into my wetsuit, down to the boat, on board and away, no hesitation at all. Ready. Firing! <laughs> Grab it, cock! Slack away. Back away, give it to them, pay it out. Oh, and there's two men pulling that across there, there's a lot of weight. Ready when you are, Rick. Right. When you are. Slack away, fella. Take him up alongside right, now. Take him up alongside now. Right up alongside to the well. Everything went quite well. Rocket across, made fast, the veering lines, tail block, man coming back, just the job. As soon as he's approaching the stern of the boat and reminding yourself that this boat will be pitching about, so you won't be able to crawl around like a load of out-of-work wrens. Do you know what I mean? I don't go to church, 
because I don't think that you've got to go to church if you want to speak to God. I can speak to God sitting here. What do I want to go to church for? I mean, uh, I know who's out there helping me when I'm out there. And I truly believe that, you see. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't wait for me breath. You might be having a quick few words in the wheelhouse while the lads are outside getting everything ready, just to sort of uh, make sure he's about. And uh, I think it helps you. I think it helps you, uh, helps you through the nasty bits. Yeah? The Sheerness lifeboat has been in existence now 10 years, where some lifeboats have been in existence over 100 years. And consequently, the, co the community have practically built up round the lifeboat, especially in some of these small fishing villages. When you arrive at a commercial port, as Sheerness is, then you haven't got that community spirit towards the lifeboat. And it doesn't really matter to us if the population of Sheppey didn't know we had a lifeboat. We're not there for that sort of thing. It's the story of a little community sheltered from the storms by its surrounding hills, the seaside town of Salka. And it's the tale of a group of people, ordinary people, who do an extraordinary job. In the old days, the lifeboat crew were all local fishermen. Now the fishing industry here is in decline, and only one of the crew was even born in Salcombe. Theirs is a tale of our times. Frank is the only full-time crew member. The rest are volunteers who get paid a fiver a trip as a teacher, a baker, a publican, a hearing aid specialist, and a milk lady. They all have to live and work within running distance of the boathouse. Come on, granddaughter. Frank's assistant mechanic is Mark Featherstone. Okay, He's a lady's hairdresser. Frank first asked me to consider going on the crew. I thought to myself, well, can I do the job or not? And he took me out in a few shouts, and I, I enjoyed it so much. I thought, right, let's go for it. See, the thing was, I didn't know anything, really, about boating as such. So he's, I owe really everything I've learned to Frank and Peter Brown as well. Peter was bloody good too. Daughter of a local fisherman, Lucy is one of only a handful of women on Britain's offshore lifeboats. I'm not doing it because I want to be one of the first ones. I've always wanted to be on the lifeboat. If you bring somebody back or you, you know, you go out and you bring a boat back, you bring people back safely. It's really good. Because it can't be very nice being stuck out at sea when it's rough and you've broken down or whatever. I mean, if I was out there, I'd be so relieved to see somebody coming to get me. It's a despairing irony that the RNLI's best public image is always underlined by disaster. A reminder that lifeboatmen not only risk, but sometimes lose their lives. In Fraserburgh, in North East Scotland, they've had to mourn too often. In 1919, two of their men were lost when the lifeboat was overwhelmed only just outside the harbour wall. In 1953, all but one of the crew of the Fraserburgh boat was lost when it capsized off the Pentland Firth. In 1970, again, all but one of the crew of the boat were lost in a North Sea gale. As if this wasn't enough, in 1969, in the same ferocious waters of the Pentland Firth, the Long Hope boat was lost with all hands. The Greek vessel Irene was driven aground on nearby South Ronaldsea. And in the Pentland Firth, which is acknowledged to be one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the world, the distress call went out. True to the traditions of the lifeboat service, 
the Long Hope boat put out to the rescue, into seas lashed to a fury by hurricane force winds and with waves 50 to 60 feet high. The Irene's crew were all finally saved by Breach's boy in a fine rescue operation by the Coast Guard shore-based life-saving team. But the Long Hope boat, still battling to the Irene's aid, was overwhelmed by freak seas and capsized. All her crew were lost. The upturned lifeboat, found later by her sister lifeboat from Thurso, was towed back to harbour. The gale still blows and heavy seas still break on the Cornish coast and over the remains of the Alba wrecked last year. Tragedy has visited this little seafaring community at the extreme end of England and along the beach watchers keep vigil for the bodies of the gallant crew who perished in their work of rescue. There out on the rocks lies the battered lifeboat, now high and dry, from which seven men were swept in the biggest gale within memory as they went to the assistance of a trawler in distress. One man escaped. Entangled in the gear, he was flung with the boat upon the rocks and crawled to the farm yonder on the cliffside. W. Freeman is his name. Safe at home, he recuperates from his ordeal. Here at St. Ives, the sad sequel to the lifeboat disaster is recorded. The coffins of John Cocking and his father, the coxswain, are born from the widowed mother's home. Matthew Barber, another victim, is buried on the same day, and the whole town mourns. The funerals of the other men who lost their lives are to follow. Tom Cocking, another son, walks with his sisters and supported on her way to the church is another heartbroken mourner. They were brave men, these lifeboatmen, who gave their lives to save others. In a graveyard overlooking the stormy sea, they rest in peace. Lifeboat tradition says that as you bury your dead, the boat in which they perished must be destroyed by fire. Forty miles north of Spurn Head lies Bridlington. This is remarkable film of the capsize of the lifeboat in August 1952, with the tragic loss of a crew member. Robert Redhead, bowman of the Tilly Morrison, lost his life while the boat was answering an SOS call to pick up two girls from Thornwick Bay. Every lifeboat station has its own story to tell, but because of the reticence of the crew, it's sometimes difficult to ferret out the facts. In small coastal towns, the lifeboat, its crew and its supporters are all very much a part of the community. Any loss of life is profoundly felt. Well, the worst experience was uh, in November 1956 when we rescued the crew of a French trawler off uh, Skomer Island. Her engine had broken down and she was making water as well and she's drifting onto the Wild Goose race. Did you get them all back safely? Oh yes, we got all the survivors back safely, but we lost one member of the crew, our own crew. That's when our boat heeled over. She very nearly capsized, went over at an angle of 90 degrees. And she hung there for a few seconds, and. A before she had time to right herself, another sea hit her and she went over again. She was completely swamped. I thought myself that the engines were stopped because I couldn't hear anything at all in the boat. But uh, all at once then she, she shook herself and came up again. But uh, a couple of minutes after, somebody said there's one of the crew missing. Was that one of the old-timers on the crew? No, he's a young fellow. One of the young chaps. And uh, probably the buoyancy of his life sucked at lifting him out of the boat. And how did that affect the city here when they heard the news? Oh, well, it was a nasty blow to the people of St. David's. Did it hurt the morale of the lifeboat? No, not at all. No, I had a new member of the crew the following day. The disaster at Pen Lee in Cornwall, with the whole lifeboat crew drowned one December night in 1981, is another such tragedy. 
They were going to the aid of a cargo ship in hurricane force winds near the Taitadu Light. The southeasterly storm was driving the vessel along the coast towards the rocks. The lifeboat Coxon and his crew of seven launched down the steep ramp in their 47-foot Watson-class lifeboat, Solomon Brown. They all came from the small fishing village of Mausel. They'd successfully rescued men from the notorious Torrey Canyon, a ground on rocks and spewing out oil between the Isles of Scilly and Land's End. But that night in 1981, the Solomon Brown was seen to make several runs to the stricken cargo ship, by now close to the steep cliffs that were being smitten by horrendous seas. Then, nothing. It had been a total disaster. Send up the maroons. Over the years, film directors, perhaps in an attempt to lighten what is, after all, a serious subject, have frequently fallen for the old cliché that all lifeboatmen wait in pubs for the maroons to be fired. Hello. Hello, shine. To be truthful, not all lifeboat stories are about doom and gloom. Look at the fun they're having here. Once a year in early summer, Weymouth organises a trawler race and regatta in the harbour. It makes money for the RNLI, but more than that, the event shows just how important the lifeboat has become to the life of the port and its people. Whatever changes are made to boats and equipment, the spirit of our lifeboatmen will always remain the same. It was of this spirit that Sir Winston Churchill once said, it drives on with a mercy that does not quail in the presence of death. It drives on as a proof, a symbol, a testimony that man is created in the image of God and that valour and virtue have not perished in the British race.